everyone, welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Today we have some exciting news. We recently launched our new podcast, Greybeard's Jewels, A Step Into the Unknown. Narrated by none other than Greybeard himself. We plan on having lots of scary stories, urban legends, mythologies, and all kinds of other topics. And we'll feature an occasional special guest, too. Be sure to check us out wherever you get your podcasts, or see the description below for a link. And now, without any further ado, here are 10 fun facts about Oregon. Number 1. The Columbia River Gorge is a canyon along the Columbia River and forms a portion of the Washington-Oregon border. Not only is it a beautiful location showcasing scenic views, breathtaking falls, and some wild and crazy rapids, but it's also considered one of the best windsurfing and kiteboarding locations in the world. There are options for all skill levels along the gorge. Just starting out? The Hook in Hood River, a sheltered cove, is a great spot. Well experienced or advanced? Check out Rooster Rock in Corbett, where winds sometimes reach up to 80 miles per hour. Number 2. Tillamook Rock Light, known locally as Terrible Tilly, is a deactivated lighthouse which sits on less than an acre of basalt rock, located a little over a mile offshore from Tillamook Head. Since 1980, under private ownership, and after reinforcement and restoration, the former lighthouse has functioned as Eternity at Sea Columbarium, the final resting place of 30 funerary urns. The columbarium operates much like a traditional cemetery, with the exception being it can only be accessed by helicopter due to the hazardous conditions, and not at all during the nesting season of endangered and protected seabirds. Number 3. Yurts originated in Central Asia and were used as shelter by nomadic cultures, and Oregon was the first state to introduce them as an option for campers in their state parks. Yurts are cylindrical dome structures with wooden frames that support canvas walls, and while offering amenities such as simple beds, heat, light, and electricity, they still offer guests a rustic experience and better protection from the elements than traditional tenting. There are even some deluxe models that boast private baths and kitchenettes. As of 2019, 32 parks in the system have nearly 200 yurts available to guests as a year-round camping rental. Before we go any further, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on notifications so you won't miss a thing. Thank you for your support. Number 4. In Salem, perched atop the state capitol, you will see the 22-foot-tall Oregon Pioneer statue, known locally as the Gold Man. The statue was created by sculptor Ulrich Ellerhusen as a tribute to symbolize the hardy settler who journeyed to Oregon from far away to make a home for himself in this beautiful land. The eight-and-a-half-ton bronze sculpture with gold leaf finish was completed in New Jersey and shipped to Oregon to be installed on a marble pedestal situated atop the newly finished capital in 1938, which was built to replace the previous versions which had burnt down. Number 5. At the Albany Historic Carousel and Museum, over 400 volunteers have donated nearly 50,000 hours of their time to a very unique revitalization project. Together with experienced leaders, volunteers of any skill level, even beginners, have been involved in creating the world's finest carousel. From hand carving and painting the whimsical menagerie of animals to helping restore the 1909 Denzel Carousel Corporation mechanism, which was donated by a descendant of the founder. Volunteers can also choose to act as a docent for the museum or associate at the gift shop, not to mention help staff carnivals and other events that together draw over 160,000 visitors annually. Number 6. The beaver, North America's largest rodent, has been Oregon's official state animal since 1969. Beavers were such a large part of the state's early economy that they not only earned a spot on the reverse of the flag, but inspired the state's nickname as well. Early settlers to the beaver state trapped the animal for its meat as well as its fur, which came into high demand as beaver pelt hats were quite fashionable in the day. Unfortunately, this led to overhunting. 
but the state stepped in and put a management program in place, ensuring the beaver would remain a part of Oregon's diverse wildlife. Number 7. Powell's City of Books in Portland is the world's largest used in new bookstore. Since the store first opened on a corner in 1971, it has now grown to encompass an entire city block that houses over a million books. The giant bookstore features nine color-coded rooms and over 3,500 sections. So, regardless of your preferred genre, you're sure to find what you're looking for inside. A brilliant and unique feature is the rare book room, which draws book lovers from near and far to browse their collection of rare and collectible books, including first editions and autograph copies number eight crater lake in south central oregon is the deepest lake in the united states and among the deepest in the world at nineteen hundred and forty nine feet deep the deep blue clear waters of the lake are the main attraction of crater lake national park which encompasses the caldera of mount mazama which formed when the volcano collapsed almost eight thousand years ago the lake filled entirely by precipitation and snow melt contains wizard island a volcanic cinder cone topped with its own small crater dubbed the witch's cauldron and a rock pillar island named phantom ship as it resembles a ghost ship especially in foggy or dimly lit conditions number nine the willamette meteorite was discovered in willamette valley near west lynn long ago as there was no impact crater at the site it's believed the meteorite landed on an ice cap in either montana or western canada and was dragged to its resting place by glaciers and flooding the meteorite is composed of ninety one per cent iron seven point six two per cent nickel and contains traces of cobalt and phosphorus and other elements scarcely appearing in the earth's crust such as iridium Amazingly, the approximately 10-foot by 6.5-foot meteor weighs over 15 tons. You can check it out for yourself at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Number 10. The Seaside Aquarium is one of the oldest aquariums on the West Coast and was the first in the world to successfully breed harbor seals in captivity. The privately owned aquarium opened in 1937 in a building formerly used as a saltwater bathhouse and swimming pool. In addition to the regular aquarium attractions, there is an area where you can feed the 11 seals, all bred at the facility, and watch them clown around for the guests. On average, seals in the wild live around 15 years, and in captivity, 20 years. But one seal, named Clara, lived 35 years. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Greybeard's Jewels. And don't forget to check out the podcast, too. Bye! Hey everybody, welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Today, we bring you five urban legends from Brazil. Number one, the Curupira, a.k.a. the Forest Guardian. The Curupira is a red or flame-haired guardian of the forest that has varying appearances throughout the land. Whether dwarf-like or giant, one feature remains the same, his backward-facing feet. Not only is it a most interesting feature, but it also comes in quite handy as it makes tracking him down extremely difficult since his trail seemingly begins where it actually ends. Although they can be extremely dangerous, emitting an otherworldly whistling noise that can leave you disoriented or driven to madness, they aren't generally hostile beings. They live mainly in the Amazon rainforest, protecting it and the animals that call it home against glacier hunters and poachers. If you really want to get on their bad side, the worst thing a person could do is kill a mother with offspring. The Kurupira will turn the offending hunter's arrow right back at them, killing them instead. Or they could choose to lead the hunter into an unfamiliar part of the forest and leave them there, forever lost. And if he was feeling especially feisty, he might decide to turn the hunter's family into animals that then would be hunted and killed, leaving the hunter all by himself with no family. So, if you ever find yourself wandering about a Brazilian rainforest and you think the Curupira might be playing tricks on you, you might want to grab some vines and start tying knots in them. 
You might be wondering, who has time for that at a time like this? But if you leave them on the ground where you're traveling, they just can't fight their nature and will feel compelled to untie all the knots you made, keeping them occupied long enough for you to make a quick getaway. Number 2. The Headless Mule A Curse From God it is said that the legend of the headless mule is deeply rooted in Catholic belief, and it all started because a priest who had vowed celibacy was having relations with a woman. As a result, God was of course displeased, and so he cursed the woman to become the headless mule, with fire coming out of her neck and, in some variations, the tail as well. She would transform into the fiery-headed beast and rampage her way through town, destroying everything and everyone in her path. The same fate would be bestowed upon any woman who sinned in this matter, always transforming on Thursday nights to wreak havoc on the city and its inhabitants, then returning to her body Friday mornings, naked and confused, not remembering a thing, just feeling intense pain throughout her entire body. There are only two ways to break the curse of the headless mule. You either must get some blood out of her or remove her red-hot reins. Not an easy task considering the inferno spewing from her neck. If you do accomplish this feat, take the woman to a church so a priest can curse her seven times this way and she won't turn back into the headless mule again. Number 3. Kuka, the Old Witch the Kuka is a hag that lives in a cave, making all sorts of spells in her cauldron. She's a part human, part crocodile-like woman with an extremely high, shrill voice. Her weapon a choice to stun little kids who misbehave or won't go to sleep on time. She will then kidnap them and eat them up later. In doing so, she absorbs their vital energy so she can extend her own life. She can get in from anywhere. It's like she just appears. She even gets parents to sing a dark and eerie lullaby to their babies. I'll save your ears and just tell you what it says. Sleep, little baby. Kuka is coming to get you. Daddy went to the fields and Mommy went to her job. Not the kind of rhyme I'd like to hear if I was trying to fall asleep. But hey, the Kuka will live on forever. Before we go any further, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe, and don't forget to turn on notifications. It's free to do, and it really helps our channel out. Thank you! Number 4. Corpo Seco, or The Dry Body From the interior of Sao Paulo, Mina Gerais, and the Midwest region comes the legend of Corpo Seco. Relatively recent compared to most legends, this one started in the mid-20th century. In life, Corpo Seco was so selfish, cruel, and downright mean to every person he would meet that one day he was killed by a vigilante and buried in the local cemetery. He was so vile and evil in life that neither God nor the devil wanted his soul. Now that's bad. After being rejected by both God and the devil, his soul was sent back among the living realm. And guess what? The earth didn't want it either. So she spit his body out of the grave over and over again. He started to haunt the area, seeking vengeance. Corpo Seco is kinda like a zombie, but without the brains part. And it's said he stays up in the tops of trees and comes down around 8pm in search of his next victim. Or if he's lucky, victims. So if you're out walking the road or path and it's around 8pm, and you hear something in the trees. It might just be the Corpo Seco coming for you. Number 5. The Kaipura, or Inhabitant of the Forest The Kaipura are beings of Tupi-Guarani lore in Brazil similar to the Curupira in that they are protectors of the forest and its inhabitants. It appears as a small, dark-skinned Native American that's naked and has a red mane. Whether male or female, it's usually smoking a cigar, and some say it rides a great peccary and carries a stick. In some regions, they are known to be very mischievous and are said to scare away prey and hide the animal's tracks. Or, if the hunters are taking more than what is necessary or using unethical hunting practices, they may even disorient the hunters by making animal noises and fake tracks, causing them to lose their way in the jungle. 
In some areas, the indigenous tribes are quite wary of the creature and believe the Kaipura is afraid of light, so they would protect themselves by carrying a piece of burning wood when walking in the forest. According to popular belief, the creature is very active on days in which hunting is not supposed to take place. So, Fridays, Sundays, and some religious days, you should probably be on your best behavior. But, there are claims you can trick or bribe the protector of the forest. It's well known that the Kaipura loves tobacco, so on Thursday nights, the hunters would leave a cigar or other form of smoke by the trunk of a tree and recite Toma Kaipura Daisha i Ir Imbora, which basically means, Here you go, Kaipura, let me go on my way, in Portuguese. These offerings to the creature are also said to ensure the good luck of the hunters, so don't forget to leave a gift to the Kaipura, or he might go after you next. We hope you enjoyed today's video, and we'll see you next time on Greybeard's Jewels. Hi everybody, welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Today, we want to start off with a quick shout out to subscriber Shoraf Hussein. Thank you for your support. Want your own shout out? Comment the word shout out below. And without further ado, here are 10 fun facts about Kentucky. Number 1. The Kentucky Derby has been run at Churchill Downs in Louisville every year since 1875. The race was founded by the grandson of William Clark of the famed Lewis and Clark Exploration Team and is modeled after horse racing events in England and France. Tradition is strong at the Derby. Both men and women don their finest fashions, topped with extravagant hats, and many enjoy sipping the traditional Derby favorite, mint juleps. And each year, the winning horse is draped with a blanket of roses. The fastest horse to win? Secretariat, with a time of 1 minute 59.40 seconds. Number 2. Corvettes came into existence in 1953 and have been an American sports car favorite ever since. Originally built in Flint, Michigan, then St. Louis, Missouri for many years, their production was moved to Bowling Green in the early 80s and has remained there ever since. This iconic car has been featured in films like Corvette Summer, a 1978 film featuring Mark Hamill of Star Wars fame, and TV shows like Route 66 and songs such as Prince's Little Red Corvette. Number 3. Kentucky Fried Chicken was created by Colonel Harlan Sanders in Corbin, Kentucky during the Great Depression. Originally selling fried chicken from his roadside restaurant, perfecting his secret recipe and technique for cooking chicken, Colonel Sanders developed the tasty fast food chicken we all know and love today. Colonel Sanders traveled the world pitching his methods to restaurant owners and the first franchise was opened in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1952. Along with his methods and recipes, franchising rights include the use of his likeness and persona for advertising. Before we go any further, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on all notifications so you don't miss a thing. And thank you to all our new and current subscribers. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. Number 4. Cumberland Falls State Resort Park is packed with things to do, from camping and hiking to mining for gems and bird watching. But the most unique attraction is the falls themselves. Cumberland Falls offers visitors a chance to see a phenomenon known as a moonbow. Much like its daylight equivalent, the rainbow, the moonbows occur when light is refracted from tiny droplets of water. If skies are clear, the moonbows can be seen a day or two on either side of a full moon. Once a regular occurrence over Niagara Falls, they are no longer seen there due to the light pollution. Number 5. The McCoy family of the famously feuding Hatfields and McCoys hailed from Pike County and the Hatfield family resided nearby in West Virginia. The families lived along the Tug Fork of the Big Sandy River and both were in the timber and moonshine businesses and coexisted peacefully until Asa McCoy fought for the Union during the Civil War while the others all sided with the Confederacy. A Confederate raid killed the man whom Asa served under and it was with the Hatfields he sought revenge. 
The family learned of Asa's plan against their patriarch, and he was killed before it could be carried out. This of course enraged the McCoys, and the feud was on. Number 6. St. Mary's Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption in Covington is home to what is believed to be the world's largest handmade stained glass window in a church. It's 67 foot high and 24 foot wide. This work of art is truly awe-inspiring and depicts both the coronation of Mary after her Assumption and the Council of Ephesus. The basilica boasts many other beautiful works of art and gorgeous Gothic architecture throughout and is truly a sight to behold. Number 7. Fort Knox is home to the United States Bullion Depository. Commonly referred to as Fort Knox, the fortified vault is located nearby the Fort Knox Army Base, and the name is synonymous with security. The depository is highly guarded, not only by the United States Mint Police, but inside the fence that surrounds the site, there are rings of razor wire and minefields. The facility stores and protects over half the U.S. gold reserves, around 150 million troy ounces, and has housed many priceless items at varying times throughout history. Number 8. Students at Transylvania University in Lexington enter a lottery. The prize for four lucky winners is a night in the on-campus tomb of eccentric naturalist and professor Constantine Raffinesque. He was known internationally for his research in botany, and he taught at the university from 1819 to 1826. And upon being removed from his post, he famously placed a curse on the university that takes place every seven years. Today, he is still very much part of the university, and students pay homage annually with a convocation, torchlight parade, and dance around Halloween. Number 9. Bourbon County is where the alcoholic beverage gets its name. The iron-free calcium-imparting water in the area reduces bitterness and adds a slight sweetness to the finished product. Bourbon is a type of whiskey only produced in the United States, mainly using corn. Critical to the process is a minimum of two years of aging the distilled beverage in a new charred oak barrel, which imparts the distinct flavors attributed to fine bourbon. Approximately 95% of all bourbon is still produced in Kentucky. Number 10. Famous faces from Kentucky include the greatest of all time, legendary boxer Muhammad Ali, born as Cassius Clay in Louisville. Captain Jack Sparrow himself, actor Johnny Depp, was born in Owensboro. 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, was born in Hodgenville. Legendary country singer Loretta Lynn was born in Butcher Holler, and she really was a coal miner's daughter, as her famous song states. Not to mention her also famous little sister, country singer Crystal Gale, known for her hit Don't It Make My Brown Eyes Blue, as well as her iconic floor-length hair, was born in Paintsville. In closing, we hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Greybeard's Jewels. Hey everybody, welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Today we bring you 10 bone chilling beasts and beings of British lore. Number 1 The Woodwose. Tales of the Bigfoot like wild man said to inhabit the forests of Europe have been around since pre Christian times, and the creature has been likened to Sylvanus, the Roman god of the woodlands, and commonly the Sasquatch of American lore. The area of Yellowham Woods, located just outside of Dorchester, is said to be a hot spot for these wild men. Historically, these savage, hairy, human-like creatures have been said to have a fondness for stealing away young women, and have often been blamed for unwed pregnancies, while almost definitely an unwitting scapegoat for what were considered unscrupulous women of the time. Tales of this creature may, however, hold some truth. As recently as the summer of 2014, two members of the British Bigfoot Research Organization, who actively investigate sightings of hairy ape-man type creatures around the UK, paid a visit to Yellowham Woods and conducted a two-night study in the creepy dark forest. 
their loud clapping a technique sometimes used to elicit a response from these creatures was rewarded with tree knocking in return not to mention the sounds of something creeping about in the darkness nearby during their investigation they also discovered a stick structure and possible tree breaks known to be a signature of bigfoot like creatures they also came across impressions in the mud that were big enough to be wild man footprints along with the sounds of whooping howls certainly spooked they made their way for the car as they heard what sounded like a tree crashing down behind them sounds pretty convincing to me have you ever had a bigfoot encounter let us know in the comments below number two the screaming skull encounters with screaming skulls have been reported for centuries with accounts of human skulls that would fly around chasing and terrorizing people at random with unearthly maniacal screams as they evaded capture usually though these skulls are a bit more discerning in their choice of victims keeping content and quietly resting in peace until someone dare disturbs them they then will begin with the moaning and wailing slamming of doors and pounding on walls and anything else they desire to terrorize the offending party it appears most times that the person whose skull is doing the haunting had requested to be laid to rest at a certain location or actually inside their own homes and for whatever reason probably the fact that most people don't want a dead body in their house that request is not honored Soon after burial, the living inhabitants will notice their once quiet, ideal existence is no longer that way. Upon reflection, they realize the error of their ways and return the decedent skull to their homes. This appeases the spirit and all remains quiet until the next foolish person tries to remove it. I know I wouldn't want to get chased around by a flying skull, no way. So I'm thinking the best bet is to let a resting skull lie and not risk incurring the wrath of the screaming skull. Number 3. The Jai Trash You don't want to find yourself wandering about on a remote path in northern England, or you might be visited by a Jai Trash. This creature is a shapeshifter of sorts and has been said to appear as a horse, mule, or cow, but usually they seem to prefer taking on the form of a large black dog. And sometimes it's been said that its eyes even glow red. As you're strolling along in seclusion, the jai trash will suddenly appear in your path, and depending on circumstances and the otherworldly creature's mood, your day may get better, or much, much worse. There have been tales of the Jai Trash leading lost travelers onto the right path, or even protecting them from harm. But there have been far more accounts of people being attacked or led astray, perhaps lost forever. Some even say a sighting of the creature is a bad omen, and you'll soon meet your death. Before we go any further, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe, and don't forget to turn on all notifications so you don't miss a thing. And thank you to all our new and current subscribers. We really appreciate your support, and couldn't do it without you. Number 4. Spring-Heeled Jack Claims of encounters with this nimble villain were rampant in 19th century London and the surrounding area. The Spring-Heeled Jack is a devilish gent with a flair for mischief and bad behavior, often said to play pranks and scare townsfolk, and it seems as time went on he became a bit more debaucherous in his way. He was said to appear from nowhere, striking from the darkness, then quick as a flash bound away in giant leaps, impossible for any man often squealing with delight and shrill high-pitched laughter as he made his way over high fences and across the rooftops later his hapless victims would describe a tall thin figure with ears and nose to match dressed in a tight-fitting white suit dark-colored cape and helmet to boot with glowing red eyes and sharp metallic claws for fingers some even said he had the ability to spit blue and white flames from his mouth using this to disorient his victims as he made his escape in one account of a spring hill jack attack mary stevens a servant girl who was walking through clapham common alone late at night claimed he jumped out from the shadows of a dark alley grabbed her in his vice-like grip kissed her and ripped off her clothes 
she managed to escape her assailant but those who came to her aid were unable to locate the attacker the following day the attacker was seen near her house then in a flash he jumped in front of a passing carriage causing the driver to careen off the road and end up severely injured then much to everyone's disbelief he escaped by jumping over a nine-foot wall similarly two young women in london reported attacks by the slick trickster in which he impersonated an officer of the law gaining their trust then striking catching them quite off guard another one of the most notable spring-heeled jack sightings came in august of eighteen seventy seven from a group of soldiers in aldershot's barracks a sentry noticed a strange figure in the darkness who ended up slapping him in the face when a guard shot at the figure there was no visible effect then the figure disappeared into the darkness with long leaps there are different theories as to who or what spring-heeled jack is many speculating it was simply young men of the upper class dressing and misbehaving this way to win bets amongst their friends with copycats keeping the legend alive but how could they bound so high others believe it was a paranormal creature perhaps a demon summoned here by practitioners of the occult to cause trouble and mayhem either way it sounds pretty creepy to me definitely not something or someone i hope to ever see number five doubles and doppelgangers these duplicate beings have existed in legend and lore since ancient times and things never seem to end well when one has been spotted these beings are known to work in a few different ways if you happen upon your own double your fate is usually sealed and you will soon die but in some cases the double will act as more of an evil twin and lead you astray giving bad advice or clouding your judgment usually resulting in injury or death if you see another person's double it may be the foretelling of their death or other traumatic happening or sometimes a person will come upon a friend or family member and their double at the same time of course the doppelganger will try to make you believe that they are truly the person you know so how are you supposed to tell legend has it that these doubles do not cast a shadow according to legend queen elizabeth i entered her bedroom and found her doppelganger lying on her bed looking pale and sickly soon she herself fell ill and passed away in that same bed an example from the victorian age is that of vice admiral sir george tryon as the story goes everyone in attendance at a party his wife was throwing at their home in eaton square saw him walk through the drawing-room and crowd a guest never speaking a word just looking steadfastly ahead as he went which surprised everyone as he was supposed to be away at sea doing maneuvers soon word was received he was indeed at sea and went down with his ship the h m s victoria that very same night when it collided with another ship after following a bizarre and unexplained order to turn the ship in the direction of another this seems to be an example of double doppelganger duty as it sounds like the doppelganger paid the family and friends a visit while the evil twin was visiting the vice-admiral which would account for the questionable decision that led to his and likely many other deaths whether deja vu premonition or otherworldly being one thing is for sure if you happen to find yourself staring face to face with well yourself and there's no mirror don't stick around to strike up a conversation number six changelings these duplicitous beings have been a part of british folklore and legends for centuries a changeling is believed to be a fairy left in the place of a human whom the fairies have abducted usually the fairies will take a human baby and leave theirs for the human parents to raise soon the family will notice a difference in their child they may appear sickly and won't grow yet have an insatiable appetite or a previously happy baby will start crying and fussing all the time 
the changeling initially resembles the human child for which it has been substituted but gradually grows uglier in appearance and behavior ill-featured malformed ill-tempered and given to screaming and biting and may be of less than usual intelligence but may equally be well identifiable on account of its more than childlike wisdom and cunning fairies would also take adult humans especially the newly married or new mothers young adults were taken to marry fairies instead while new mothers were often taken to nurse fairy babies often when an adult was taken instead of a child an object such as a log enchanted to look like the person was left in place of the stolen human the object left in the place of the human would seem to sicken and die to be buried by the human family while the living human was among the fairies bridget cleary is one of the most well-known cases of an adult thought to be a changeling by her family her husband killed her attempting to force the fairies out to return his real wife so why would a fairy take a human and replace it with one of their own there are a few theories as to the reason some say they want their child to experience the loving care a human family would provide their own child others say the old and sickly of the fairy realm are left with the humans to be loved and coddled by the humans making their remaining time peaceful and easy meanwhile the human child could either be used as a servant or for the love that a human child would provide sometimes the humans were treated well by their abductors but at times babies were said to be taken out of pure spite for humans simple charms such as an inverted coat or open iron scissors left where the child sleeps were thought to ward them off other measures included a constant watch over the child it was thought if the changeling could be tricked into revealing itself the gig was up and the fairy would return to their realm and the human child to its family it seems the large appetites would often betray them and a common method was said to put a stew inside of an eggshell making it appear as if it was meant to feed the entire family the raffinous changeling would be so shocked by this he wouldn't be able to help himself and exclaim he's never seen such a thing in all of his time sadly though the belief in these beings was so strong that often horrible methods were employed to drive out the changelings either placing it in a hot oven or by holding it in a shovel over a hot fire or bathing it in a solution of foxglove unfortunately these methods often resulted in the deaths of the abnormal or sickly children who in reality were likely suffering from a birth defect disease or other abnormality that was not yet understood number seven the wyvern throughout british history these legendary bipedal winged beasts have been seen as a symbol of strength and courage but also death and destruction a smaller version of the formidable dragon these creatures were said to be fearless and vicious in the face of any enemy and were significant in heraldry as a sign of strength and bravery examples of which are still seen today the wyvern is often depicted with a long tail ending in either a diamond or arrow-shaped tip two legs ending in talons and bat-like wings in various accounts the tips of their tail were thought to be stingers capable of delivering a mighty venom their toxic breath was capable of spreading pestilence and death throughout the land thus they were blamed by many as the source of the black plague which took millions of lives some accounts tell of their ability to spit fireballs at their victims or the straw roofs on their homes spreading death and destruction in their wake there have been accounts of these beasts taking up residence in lakes or caves coming out of their dens only after the sun would set then ravenously eating the livestock from the nearby towns these reptilian creatures have also been said to loot and plunder shiny objects and treasures hoarding them in their lairs either way they sound pretty scary to me and i think i would never want to come across one even if there may be treasure to be had number eight the beast of bodmin moor 
and like many other beasts of lore this creature wasn't known until the latter part of the twentieth century the otherwise innocuous area of bodmin moor in cornwall england has been inundated with tales of this phantom wildcat for decades the beast of bodmin moor is more often said to resemble a large black leopard or panther and has been spotted hundreds if not thousands of times over the years some witnesses have reported the large black cat appearing in their path locking its silvery white eyes with them for a moment before casually sauntering off others have spotted the beast in their own yards or gardens supposedly lazing about after digesting their meals some have even reported the beast to have a more paranormal or otherworldly presence seeming to appear from within a fog that suddenly rolls in or even beginning to disappear in front of them as they are walking away while scientists and researchers have not found proof of this creature's existence they cannot fully discount the possibility either in nineteen ninety eight video footage was released that clearly showed a black animal probably a big cat around three and a half feet long the video was described by a wild cat expert as the best evidence yet that big cats do indeed roam bodmin moor there have also been some rather grainy photos captured of the beast and giant feline footprints have been found some people have even claimed to have had more than one encounter with the beast which seems to be rather indifferent toward humans there have been livestock and other animal mutilations in the area blamed on this phantom black cat while some sightings of a more puma or mountain lion-like creature have been attributed to an animal trainer named mary chipperfield who likely released three of her favorites into the wild when her zoo was shut down in nineteen seventy eight the origins of the large black feline are unknown what are your thoughts is this perhaps a species of big cat yet to be discovered or one that was previously thought extinct could this be an otherworldly creature or simply an exaggerated overgrown house cat let us know in the comments number nine the bluebok for centuries the welsh have told tales of these house goblins who in exchange for a bit of cream biscuit or perhaps even ale will perform household chores throughout the night they are described as being around three foot tall with dark skin and covered in hair preferring to be naked or dressed in simple rags but have alternately been described as quite tiny at just a couple of inches tall and are experts at sneaking about and hiding sometimes even having the ability to become invisible these impish beings are also quite fond of playing tricks if they feel the maids are being lazy they may just pinch them as they sleep or hide your objects in the strangest of places even though they are generally of a benevolent nature these beings are easily offended and if they feel they've been wrong will either leave your home forever or in some cases become boggarts or bogeyman like in nature there are a few common ways to offend these creatures such as offering them clothing giving them a name or speaking to them directly and one of the worst things you could do is forget to leave your offering they are also said to greatly dislike those who do not drink alcohol sounds like these guys might not be half bad who wouldn't want to wake up to find everything done you didn't have time to finish the night before number ten black shuck although his footfalls make no sound you will surely know black shuck is around as his terrifying howling gives him away this hellhound takes the form of a large shaggy black dog some say as big as a horse that is often mentioned to be foaming at the mouth and at least one account claimed it to possess one glowing red eye but this feature doesn't seem to be widespread these devil dogs have a habit of appearing suddenly out of nowhere wreaking havoc and disappearing in much the same way while it is believed by some to be a protective spirit perhaps even an incarnation of deceased ancestors it is more widely seen as a harbinger of death whether your own or someone with whom you are acquainted one of the shuck's most famous exploits happened in fifteen seventy seven where he made appearances at the churches of bungay and blythburg both recorded as having occurred on august fourth 
at Blythburg, Black Shuck is said to have burst through the doors of Holy Trinity Church to a clap of thunder. He ran up the nave, past a large congregation, killing a man and boy, and causing the church steeple to collapse through the roof. As the dog left, he left scorch marks on the north door, which can still be seen at the church to this day. At Bungay, this black dog, or some even believe, the devil himself, appearing as such, was seen running all along down the body of the church with great swiftness and incredible haste, among the people in a visible form and shape passed between two persons as they were kneeling and occupied in prayer as it seemed wrung the necks of them both at one instant climbed backwards in so much that even at a moment where they kneeled they strangely died while this beast is said to wander the lonely dark paths of the countryside similar to the jai trash we talked about earlier this particular beast seems to prefer prowling churchyards so there you have it folks have any of you ever had an encounter with one of these beasts or beings or know someone who has tell us your story we'd love to hear from you as always thank you for watching and we'll see you next time on graybeard's jewels Hey everyone, welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Today we bring you 10 interesting facts about Pennsylvania. Number 1. Hershey is the chocolate capital of the United States. Founder Milton S. Hershey developed the town as a pleasant and enjoyable place for his workers to live, and he felt happy workers were productive employees. Not only is it home to the Hershey Company, producers of the world-famous Hershey Bar, and a multitude of other chocolatey confections, the area also boasts attractions such as Hershey Park and Hershey's Chocolate World. Visitors to Hershey Park can enjoy thrilling roller coasters, classic family rides, and even a water park. And Hershey's Chocolate World encompasses all things chocolate, and you can create your own candy bar, customized all the way down to the wrapper. Number 2 The first zoological garden in the United States opened in Philadelphia in July of 1874. For the price of a quarter for adults and a dime for children, visitors could see over 600 different animals, including bears, leopards, monkeys, and more. Today, the zoo is a premier facility for breeding animals that are difficult to breed in captivity, and boasts the first captive birds in the United States of an orangutan and chimpanzee in 1928 and the first captive-born cheetah in the world in 1956. The original Victorian stone facade columns and wrought iron gateway still stand today. Number 3. The Great Dane was named the official state dog of Pennsylvania in 1965, in honor of state founder William Penn's cherished pet. When this choice for state dog went up for a vote, legislators literally barked and growled to voice their approval. The speaker confirmed the ARF's habit, and the barking dog vote entered the annals of legislative history. Penn and his pooch are also remembered in a portrait that hangs in the governor's reception room in Harrisburg. Before we go any further, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe, and don't forget to turn on notifications. It's free to do, and it really helps the channel. Thank you. Number 4. The Rockville Bridge, just north of Harrisburg, is the longest stone masonry arch railroad viaduct in the world. Built between 1900 and 1902 by the Pennsylvania Railroad, the bridge is comprised of 220,000 tons of stone with a concrete core, and required 800 employees to build. Spanning the Susquehanna River, this 3,820-foot-long railroad bridge has 48 70-foot-wide arches and is still in use today. Number 5. Tenet Square is known as the mushroom capital of the world, with farms in the area producing over 500 million pounds of mushrooms a year, or half the U.S. mushroom crop. 
William Swain is credited with bringing mushrooms to the area by importing spores from England and experimenting with their cultivation in the space under his raised flower beds. The town hosts an annual two-day mushroom festival with a parade, tours of the mushroom farms, and of course food and vendors. They love their mushrooms so much that one year they even dropped an 800-pound mushroom instead of a ball on New Year's. Number 6. Indiana County is the Christmas tree capital of the world, awarded the title in 1956 with an estimated 700,000 trees harvested that season. To add even more to the Christmassy feel, the city of Indiana is the birthplace of actor Jimmy Stewart, who starred in the beloved Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. The city pays tribute with an annual film festival as part of their It's a Wonderful Life themed holiday celebration. Number 7. Nazareth is the home of Martin Guitars founded by C.F. Martin in 1833. They are highly respected in the industry for their quality acoustic guitars. C.F. Martin is also said to be the man responsible for inventing the steel stringed acoustic that is used all over the world today. The company also houses the Martin Guitar Museum, which features over 170 guitars they've manufactured over the years, and not to mention photos of the famous players and owners. The company has remained in the family's control for over six generations. Number 8. The Moravian Pottery and Tile Works in Doylestown is operated as a working museum, and handmade tiles are still produced in a manner similar to that developed by the pottery's founder and builder, Henry Chapman Mercer. In addition, Mercer designed and built Font Hill, his castle-like mansion on the grounds, where he displayed the various tiles made at the works. Although there was a recent change and the site began operating as the tile works, it will continue to be ran in much the same way. Number 9. Groundhog Day just wouldn't be the same without Punxsutawney Phil, the city's most famous resident and world-renowned weather forecasting rodent. Every February 2nd, the crowd gathers and anxiously awaits the verdict. Six more weeks of winter or an early spring? all hinging on whether Phil sees his shadow. Thanks to his relatively keen weather forecasting ability, Punxsutawney is billed as the weather capital of the world. The festivities gained much popularity after the 1993 movie Groundhog Day, with crowds growing from just a couple thousand to between 10 and 20,000 a year. Number 10. Philadelphia is home to the world-famous cheesesteak sandwich invented by Pat Olivieri, a hot dog vendor who was craving something a little different. The sandwich is traditionally made with thinly sliced steak, sautéed onions, and cheese, usually cheese whiz American or provolone, but there are other variations available. Another Philly favorite are locally made soft pretzels, available at many locations throughout the city and made from traditional recipes brought over by German immigrants to the area. Water ice is also a Philly staple, just water, sugar, and flavoring. Anything from real fruit to flavors such as bubblegum or chocolate, mixed all together then frozen and shaved. Like a snow cone, but better since the flavor goes all the way through this sweet treat. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Hi everyone, welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Today we bring you 10 eerie Scottish urban legends. Number 1. Sawney Bean, Scotland's most famous cannibal. The legend starts out with the newlyweds Mr. and Mrs. Sawney Bean setting up residence at Benning Cave around Ayrshire, Scotland. The cave had many tunnels extending more than a mile with plenty of room for them to start their family. Not wanting to go the typical route, Sonny chose robbery to support himself and his wife. It was going good for the two of them, but one day Sonny started thinking. He needed a way for his victims not to remember who it was who had robbed them, so he thought murdering them was a good idea. Then he thought, well, I could kill two birds with one stone, and we could just eat what I kill. It would be a good high-protein diet for he and his wife to live on, and live on they did. Soon, the family started getting bigger. Their diet of human flesh helped them produce 14 cannibalistic kids, 
Sonny had a lot of mouths to feed, so his thieving and murderous ways escalated, and the amount of people that were going missing was amassing greatly. The townspeople and authority figures of the day noticed. The Bean children grew up, and thanks to inbreeding, the family grew and grew. Now, Sonny basically had an army of killing machines out looking for their next meal. One day, though, they got careless. A couple on horseback was riding down the trail, returning from a fair, when the Bean clan attacked. They knocked the wife off her horse and had her stripped and gutted before the husband could even react to what was going on. As he came to his senses, he drew his pistol and knife and was fending off the beans. A group of about twenty people happened upon the scene as they were traveling back from the same fair. They quickly ran up to help the man. The bean clan knew that they were outnumbered and scattered back to their cave to contemplate their next move. The husband from the attack was taken to the chief magistrate of Glasgow, and with his account and that of all the eyewitnesses, the magistrate started putting two and two together with all the missing people. He decided he should take this matter to the king right away. After the king heard the horrendous story, he gathered up an army of 400 men with tracker dogs, and they set out for Ayrshire. Once there, a group of locals joined them in the hunt for the beans. Before long, their dogs picked up on the smell of rotting flesh at the entrance to the cave. With their torches lit and swords drawn, the posse entered the cave, and what they found was unbelievable, to say the least. Raw meat was hanging like a butcher shop, arms and legs were thrown all over in some tunnels, and in others were piles of clothes, and in still others they found rings and other items that belonged to the victims, and bones were thrown all over the place. The beans put up a little resistance to the army, but soon they surrendered, and were arrested and taken to Edinburgh by the king himself. Their crimes were considered so evil that the renowned Scottish justice system was tossed out and the whole family was sentenced to death. The very next day, the 27 men of the Bean family had their arms and legs cut off and were left to bleed to death, just like they had their victims. After being made to watch the men bleed out, the 21 women of the family were all burned at the stake with a huge fire, just like witches. There are publications going back to the 18th century that lend to this being a true story, so it might not just be an urban legend after all. Number 2. The Unnatural Death of Nora Fornario In the summer of 1929, Netta, as she preferred to be called, left London for what she planned to be a lengthy stay on a Scottish island very rich in folklore and history named Iona. Now, Netta wasn't just your everyday person going on vacation. She was a member of the Alpha Omega, a branch of the famous Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which the notorious Aleister Crowley was part of. The Alpha Omega was known for its practices in ritual magic tarot cards, mysticism, and telepathy, and Netta herself was said to have a strong interest in fairies as well. Once she made it to the island, she found a place to stay with Mrs. McRae, a lady who was known for taking in boarders. All through the summer, everything went fine, and Netta was enjoying her time on the island. But by the end of summer, something had changed. She sent a secret message to her housekeeper in London saying that she would be out of contact for a long period as she was in deep need of a good healing. In November, she told Mrs. McRae that she had to leave immediately to go back to London because several people were attacking her telepathically. Mrs. McRae told her that the boat to the mainland didn't run on Sundays, and Netta stormed off to her room. After what seemed like hours, she came out of her room and informed Mrs. McRae that she had a change of heart, and she would be staying on Iona. Mrs. McRae didn't notice anything different about Netta, except that all of her silver jewelry had turned black. Netta announced she was going for one of her usual walks, and out the door she went. Mrs. McRae was used to Netta going on her walks alone, so when she hadn't come back by later that afternoon, she wasn't worried. But when she hadn't come back by evening, she started letting people know. It was just too cold and windy at the time to be out walking the island. It took two days to find her body on the small island, and what they found at the site was just plain weird. There was a cross dug out of the grass by what looked like the dagger they found lying next to her. She only wore a black cloak and nothing else, and she had some slashes on her body and soles of her feet as well, but they were all superficial and nothing was bad enough to have killed her. The doctors who examined her couldn't find anything to name as a cause of death, so they just went with the old standby of exposure or heart failure. 
Her fellow practitioners of the arts didn't agree with their findings, and they firmly believed that she was killed by a psychic telepathic attack set forth by someone miles away. Number 3. The Boneless of the Shetlands this is the tale of a shapeless, white, ghostly-looking apparition the Shetland people call a frittering, because just looking at it could cause people to die of sheer fright. The Shetlands are a group of islands off the coast of Scotland, and the islanders' accounts vary. One said it looked like a large white lump of slop, while another said it looked like a huge jellyfish, and yet another said it appeared like a slimy white cloud. And one even went so far as to say it looked like an armless, legless, headless human torso. Somehow, even though it didn't have any legs, it was said to be faster than a dog and could fly higher than a hawk, all the while never making a sound. Those unlucky enough to lock eyes on it were frightened out of their minds and were found cowering in horrified terror. One night, a man was sitting at his table reading his Bible when he heard a noise at the front door, which sounded like a piece of large, wet meat slapping against it. He got up and went to the door and opened it, frightened but steadfast. The man saw nothing there until he looked down and saw a puddle of a slime-looking substance on the porch. When he looked up, he could make out in the darkness a white shapeless blob-like thing hovering in the air. He grabbed an axe off the woodpile on the porch and went after it. The mass started moving toward a cliff edge near the man's house, like it was going to go over it and just disappear. In desperation, the man threw his axe at the white mist, and to his surprise, it stuck in it and the blob fell to the ground. The man ran back to his house and gathered his family, and they hurried back to the site with their shovels to start burying the white blob. Once they had it completely buried, they dug a deep trench around it to keep people away, and then they returned home. Later the next morning, the man went into town to tell the others what had happened. After he told some folk, everyone was so interested in it that they decided to go look at it. But when they got there, the dirt was all moved around and the white blob was nowhere to be seen. Of course, the townspeople thought he was just making it up for attention, but he swore on his Bible that what he said was true. So, whatever happened to the blob, no one knows for sure. Number 4. Haunted Castle Stewart Castle Stewart in Inverness is said to be the oldest castle in Scotland, and also the most haunted. It's a luxury hotel and destination for golfers now, but centuries ago it was the scene of a brutal haunting. Servants working at the castle reported disembodied footsteps on the stairs at midnight, terrible screams, and a headless ghost man that was seen roaming the halls. The Earl of Moray inherited the castle when his father died, and he wanted to rent it out after he got it, but nobody would stay there because of the haunting rumors. So he came up with a way to prove the castle wasn't haunted, and he offered a reward to any man who was brave enough to stay the night in Castle Stewart. Word got around of the offer, but not many were willing to take the Earl up on his deal. Finally, it came down to four men. The first was a minister, the second an elder from a Presbyterian church, the third a shoemaker, and the fourth guy was a big muscular man named Rob Angus. On the first night, the minister was led to the room, and when they opened the door, he found it very peaceful inside. There was a fireplace, two chairs, a table with a lamp, a mirror, and bookcase in the room. He walked over and sat in a chair and fell asleep. While sleeping, he had a strange dream in which a big, blood-stained man came in and sat down by him. He awoke startled, but nothing was there. The next night was the elder's turn. He went into the room, sat down, and started reading his Bible. Suddenly, the door opened and a big, bloody, ghostly man appeared. The elder sat paralyzed with fright, and when he managed to look away, he looked into the mirror and saw a smiling skull was looking back at him. He then looked back at the bloody ghost man, who was now charging him with the big knife he was carrying, and the elder passed out. He was found incoherent the next morning, and it took days for him to get back to normal. On the third night, the terrified shoemaker went into the room. He sat down by the fireplace and started praying. At midnight, he heard the door slowly open. He looked over, and standing in the door was a huge creature which had no legs, but hooves instead. It lunged at the shoemaker, who passed out, and that's how they found him in the morning, still passed out. 
On the next night, the big muscled man, Rob Angus, who said he wasn't afraid of anything, was friends with the person locking the door. They went in, and as he locked the door, the man said, See you in the morning, Rob. To which he replied, You'll either find me as I am now, or dead. When he returned the next morning, he was shocked to find the room was in shambles. All the furniture was broken, the mirror was busted, and Rob was nowhere to be found. He then noticed the window was broken out, and he ran over and looked down to see the bloody, mangled body of his friend on the ground. Nobody could tell if he jumped or was pushed, but a farmer who had been herding sheep that night by the castle said it was just after midnight with a full moon when he heard loud screams and the sound of a struggle. He looked up to see a light on in one of the castle's windows, and the next thing he knew, a large man came crashing through the window and landed with an awful crunch. The farmer looked back up to the window, and to his fright, he to this day swears he saw the devil himself. Number 5. The Arthur's Seat Coffins so, the story here is that in 1836, five local lads accidentally came across something weird and extraordinary while out spending the day walking around hunting for rabbit warrens on Arthur's Seat when they made a startling discovery at the entrance to a small cave on the northeast face of the hill. What they found was 17 intricately carved miniature figurines in coffins, which were neatly set out in three tiers. The lower two had eight each on them, and the third tier was just being started, as was reported to the newspaper of the day, The Scotsman, on July 16, 1836. Most of the figurines were badly damaged, and they were purchased by a private collector who had them for a time before they went to the museum in 1901. Only eight figures in varying states of array survived. The figurines in the 17 coffins were intricately carved human effigies that were weirdly dressed, each in its unique clothes with black painted boots and distorted faces. The one on the lower tiers seemed to be less worn, leading to the conclusion that the coffins were put there over time and not just dumped there. Theories abound as to how they got there, but no one knows for sure. The eight coffins that remain and their contents are on display for the public at the National Museum of Scotland on Chambers Street. Before we go any further, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe. Number 6. The Mackenzie Poltergeist it's said the poltergeist is Sir George Mackenzie of Rosehaw, who was a Scottish lawyer and Lord Advocate who was born around 1636 and died May 8, 1691, also known as Bloody Mackenzie. He was buried in a black mausoleum in the same place his victims were buried. It's said that the ghost of Mackenzie was quietly sleeping until a homeless man broke into the tomb in 1998 who was looking to get out of the weather. Once inside, he started to have a look around and stumbled upon a pile of bones. He inspected some of the bones and realized they were human, and he hurried out of there, but not before tripping over some of the bones and falling onto and breaking them. He quickly got up and left out of there and fled into the woods, never to be seen again. This act of clumsiness seems to have awoken the poltergeist, and he started taking victims again. One was a lady who had heard of the break-in and went over to take a look. She was standing on the steps when suddenly she was sent flying backwards by an unseen force. Another woman, soon after the first, was found unconscious near the tomb, with markings and bruises on her neck indicating that something tried to strangle her to death. After these incidents, the poltergeist became popular through the internet and such, with people coming from all over the world to see if the stories were true. And not to be disappointed, they found out firsthand how real the situation was, when they were attacked and hurt without explanation while there. There is photographic evidence that has many convinced of its existence, and over 500 attacks have been reported, with occurrences ranging from unexplained burns, gouges to the stomach and neck, and many broken bones in the fingers. In 2000, Colin Grant, an exorcist, followed some ghost hunters to Greyfriars Kirkyard, where he was set to perform an exorcism. After starting the exorcism, he soon stopped and immediately left the graveyard, stating that he was in fear for his life when he he felt surrounded by hundreds of evil spirits and tormented souls. He ended up dying a month later from an unexpected heart attack. So, if this is your thing, then get over to Edinburgh, Scotland when you can. But, be forewarned, you'll likely get hurt in some way or another, so be careful. Number 7. The Nuck Levee 
The Orkney Islands of Scotland have tales going back centuries of the Nuckleby, a sea creature that appears as a horse-like demon when it ventures onto land. It's a unique and solitary creature that possesses extensive evil powers, and its malevolent behavior can influence events throughout the island. The islanders were so terrified of the creature they would not even speak its name without immediately saying a prayer. It was often found near beaches, but would never come ashore if it was raining. While no one is quite sure what form the beast takes while underwater, its appearance on land has been recounted in graphic detail. Some say the knuckle of V is similar to a centaur, with the male torso's arms reaching to the ground from its position on top of the equine body, the legs of which have fin-like appendages, and the huge head has a giant gaping mouth and a single large eye, like a burning red flame. One account of the monster by a witness named Thomas had two heads, and the equine head had an enormous gaping mouth that exuded a toxic smelly vapor, with the same single giant eye as mentioned in other accounts. A particularly gruesome detail about the Nuckleby is that it's said to have no skin and black blood courses through its yellow veins, and the pale sinews and powerful muscles are visible as a pulsating mass. The Nuckleby's breath was thought to wilt crops and sicken livestock, and it was considered responsible for epidemics and drought. Long ago, seaweed was burnt, and the byproduct soda ash helped make the soil on the island better for farming. However, the pungent smell of the smoke was said to enrage the beast, resulting in wild rampages of plague, the deaths of cattle, and destructions of crops. The Nuckleby was said to have infected horses on the island of Stronzi with a deadly disease known as Mordachine to demonstrate its fury and exact its revenge against the islanders for burning seaweed. The infection subsequently spread to all the other islands that took part in the practice. So I'm thinking if you ever go to the Orkney Islands, maybe you might want to resist the urge to put seaweed in your fire. Number 8. The Umfairly Amor, or the Big Grey Man. The Umfairly Amor has been said to live around the area of Cairngorm Peak, with sightings going back hundreds of years. While it does have some of the same characteristics as a Bigfoot or Yeti, it's far more like a demon or ghost than an alien animal human hybrid. The locals call it the Big Grey Man of Ben McDwee, or the Grey Man for short. He isn't a man at all, though. He has a foreboding presence about him that is not human. Those that have seen him say that his name came about because he has a thin layer of short fur all over his body. Hikers that approach the summit of the mountain are said to hear music playing and have a strong sense of dread upon them. They feel as if they are being drawn to the edge of the cliffs by something they can't see. One famous case is that of John Norman Colley. As he approached the summit, he felt he was being watched. As he was walking, he heard crashing footsteps behind him, but he could never see anything there. So he started running to try and shake whatever it was. He peered back again only to see nothing. He can't explain what happened to him on that day in 1925. Then there's the three men who approached the summit of the mountain. They saw a creature with a disturbingly contorted face that was anything but human. The guys started running down the mountain as fast as they could to get back to their car. Finally getting close, they turned to see the creature right behind them. They hurried into their cars, and speeding out of there, they looked over to their left, and there was the creature running alongside the car. The driver looked at the speedometer, and they were going 50 miles per hour. They were in shock and disbelief. It veered off into the woods after what seemed like miles, but was only about one mile and they were just thankful to be out of there. The stories of the Grey Man don't stop others from making the trip up the side of Cairngorm Peak. The 5,000-foot summit is a popular attraction for tourists and experienced climbers alike. As for me, well, I'll just stay here and make YouTube videos. Why, you ask? Well, let's just go with I'm afraid of heights and leave it at that. Number 9. The Red Cap the Red Cap legend comes from the borderlands of Scotland in England. The Red Cap is an evil goblin or sprite and is said to have a red cap, and he has to keep killing so he can soak his hat in his victim's blood so that it doesn't fade. 
He looks like a little old man with long, white, unkempt hair, protruding fang teeth, and he wears iron boots, which makes him very fast. He also has hideous talons on his skinny fingers, and don't forget his red blood-soaked hat. He lives in the ruins of castles in the borderlands where he waits for his unsuspecting victims to enter the ruins, where he tears them apart and soaks his cap in their blood. If the victim sees Red Cap soon enough, he can quote scripture or make the sign of the cross, and it's said that he will vanish into thin air and leave behind one of his fang-like teeth. So, when visiting Scotland, it's good to take a crucifix and memorize some scripture so the Red Cap don't get ya. Number 10. Devils in the Bins General Tam Dalyal, founder of the Royal Scots Greys and the head of the Dalyal family in the 17th century, claimed while staying at his ancestral home, the devil himself would come for a nightly game of cards. The general found himself on the losing end most of the time, but he did win one time, and the devil, in realizing his defeat, flew into a rage and threw a marble table at the general. Thankfully, the table missed the general and flew out the window and landed in the pond that was on the property. In 1870, following a particularly hard drought, a marble top card table was seen poking through the low waters of the pond. In 1930, the mother of the 20th century Tom Delio asked a local joiner to repair the legs on the table and was soon to find out that the about-to-be-retired tradesman's first job actually had been to retrieve the devil's table from the pond, eerily bringing his career full circle. In closing, we hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.